the Lord. Well, welcome to Abiding Faith Christian Center. Hello, I am Pastor Patricia Hamer. Uh, Pastor and I are so delighted that you decide to join us today for this Sunday morning worship. Our mission is establishing, empowering, and maturing lives to fulfill God's divine purpose. Our vision is through the teaching and preaching of the word, we will reach the lost, bring restoration to backsliders, give hope to the hopeless, and minister healing to the afflicted. We will bring believers to spiritual maturity, enabling them to impact this world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Abiding Faith Christian Center is located at G3237 Beecher Road, Suite F. That's in Flint, Michigan, 48532, right near the Happy Elephant. Join us for our Sunday service. Uh, Sunday Bible class at 10 a.m., Sunday morning worship at 11 a.m. in the building, and 11.30 a.m. on Facebook Live. Thursday night Bible study at 6 p.m., just one hour in the Word on Thursday night, and then, of course, our Saturday prayer at 12 noon, Saturday corporate prayer. Everyone is welcome to our services. Well, if you are ready for the Word of God, let's get ready to receive Receive our pastor, Pastor Rodney Hamer. Praise God, praise God, praise God for that truth that you said out of your mouth because you believed it in your heart. Your life will never be the same because of God's word. <clears throat> All right. Uh, we've been teaching a lesson called Transforming Your Life to the Image of God. Transforming Your Life to the Image of God. And we have a foundation of scriptures that we've been using, which is the book of Romans, the 8th chapter, verse number 29. You don't have to turn there. You can write it down for first-time visitors and those who tuned in for the first time. But the foundation of scripture that, uh, that calls this inspired uh, teaching to just well up on the side of me and develop to what it's developed into now, it says in verse 29, For whom he did foreknow, talking about God, he, God, also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. That he, the Son, <clears throat> might be the firstborn among many brethren and sisters in the body of Christ. Verse 29 of the book of, uh, a chapter of the book of Romans is God's will for the believer. Not the only will, but it's the part of the all-inclusive will and it is a major will of God that we all be conformed to the image of his son Jesus Christ and so we went through a number of scriptures to substantiate that truth and we found out some of the things that is necessary for that to take place in our lives that we be conformed to the image of his son and so we know that it is a process a process is a method for doing a certain thing, which generally requires a number of steps that must be taken to arrive at the same point, the same juncture. And so we're in an area now, we said before that outward transformation cannot take place without our submission to the will of God, which is found in the word. So to become conformed to the image of his son, there has to be the submission of the will of the individual person. And that submission must be submission to the word of God, which would ne necess necessitate that we get into the Bible, that we study the scriptures. We talked about last week, we mentioned that we had an historical example to follow uh, which is uh, to follow the image of Christ so that we would know how to be conformed to his image. We looked at several scriptures such as in the book of Luke, the second chapter, verses 41 to 51. John, the 14th chapter, verses 8 to 11. And John, the 17th chapter, verses 20 to 23. And we saw how Jesus, when he was on the earth, how he grew in wisdom. Even though he was God manifested in the flesh. But we know and realize because the scripture teaches that Jesus put off his deity. He became like a man. Like you and I. And so we know that he, the way he grew in knowledge, wisdom and knowledge was because that he always went to church. 
He was always in the temple with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the doctors and teachers of the law. And he heard them and asked them questions when he was in the church or in the temple. We also know that Jesus always prayed. And he also prayed a prayer that we would also become one with the Father even as he was one with the Father. We said last week that we must grow in wisdom and knowledge of God and the Lord Jesus Christ so that we can have the same mind that is in Christ in us. And we looked at a scripture in the book of Philippians, the second chapter, that told us that this was the will of God. So you can turn to Philippians, the second chapter. I want to read this out of the scriptures. Uh, read this out of my notes as I was meditating last night the Lord began to give me some some revelation or some things to, to, to share this morning to you now listen to this there is no neutral position in life for the born again Christian either they are deliberately doing deliberately renewing their minds to succeed in life or they are deliberately choosing not to do something to succeed in life. So there is no neutral area when you become born again in the body of Christ. There is no neutral area. You are either deliberately doing what God's word tells us to do so that we can succeed in life. Or are you deliberately choosing not to do something? You say, well, I did choose not to do something. Yes, you did. The fact that you're not doing something, especially when you heard what you're supposed to do, implies that you're choosing not to do what you know to do. To him that knoweth to do it good and do it not, it is what the Bible says. It's sin. Amen? And so there's no neutral area in our lives. The book of Philippians, I believe that you turned it already, so let me get over there. Let me catch up with you. I'm a little slow. Philippians chapter 2 and Philippians chapter 2 we're looking at verses 5 to 8 it says here he says let this mind now the Bible says this which is God's word speaking to us all scripture given under the inspiration of God which is profitable and add to your life not take away for doctrine for reproof for correction and for instructions in righteousness or instructions in doing things the way that God wants things to be done the Bible is not a religious book it is an instruction book. It was inspired to be written to instruct Christians on how to be conformed to the image of his son. So here in second Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 and 5 and, and uh, what did I say? 5 and what? 5 through 8? Let's read it together. Will you know mind? Help me read. Let's go. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. So we see that Jesus here reveals that he was made in the likeness of you and I, man, woman. But then he tells us here in the scriptures, God tells us that we're to let this mind be in us, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let this mind be in us as it was in Christ Jesus. Notice he says let. Let. The definition for the word let which I found on the online dictionary is to, to cause to or to make. It means to give opportunity to deliberately give permission or deliberately give, deliberately submit to say deliberately that was that's what it means when he says let this mind be in you let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus which also implies that there must be a time in our lives that this mindset that is in Christ Jesus is not in us.
And God understanding that because he created us, not only that, but God understood because understood what happened when we were thrown into sin by the disobedience of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden thousands of years ago, but the same effects thousands of years ago is having in a, had has had an effect upon us when we were born of our mother and father. We were dead in trespasses and sins. We walked in the we walked in the darkness of our minds. We had no understanding about God and the kingdom of God. So God knew that once we became born again that we'd have to go through a process of renewing our minds so that we can receive the abundant life that Jesus came to the earth and bought already. John 10.10, 10, Jesus says, I come that you might have life and that you have it more abundantly. He's already come. He's already done that part. Abundant life is available to every born-again believer. But every born-again believer is not enjoying that abundant life. And there's a reason why. And one of the reasons is because they do not let this mind be in them that was also in Christ Jesus. When Jesus was born on the earth of the Virgin Mary, he was born with a sinless nature. That's why the virgin birth was so important. However, he was still born into the earth with a physical body. His spirit was made like as man. He didn't operate in his deity. He was a man born in the flesh. But he didn't have a fallen nature and he availed himself to grow in wisdom and knowledge with God by attending church, attending uh, uh, in the temple before the Pharisees and Sadduc Sadducees and learning the Old Testament laws, the statutes, the precepts of God, instructions in God's word. And as a result, he grew in wisdom and in, st and in, in statue and in favor with God. The Bible says so. He grew. Well, the same way that he grew, he, God knows we need to grow the same way. So he said, let this mind. What Jesus did, we're supposed to do the same thing. So that's why when we come to church on Sunday, it's not to come so that we can be so much as inspirationalized and, you know, and, <clears throat> uh, you know, entertain, definitely not entertain, but so that we can learn, so that we can increase in wisdom. Amen? So that we can let this mind be in us that was in Christ Jesus. So, the word let implies, again, is to call to cause to. <coughs> you cause to. Or you make, or to make, you make. Or to give opportunity. You must give the opportunity for your mind, the mind of Christ, to be in you as it was in Christ Jesus. You have a responsibility. <clears throat> you must give the opportunity to, you must deliberately give permission. And to give permission means that you must, he says, submit yourself uh, uh, one to another. Submit yourselves one to another. He says in the scriptures, he says, when he descended, the same Jesus, when he descended into the lower parts of the earth to pay for the penalty of, of Adam's transgression, once it was paid for, he was raised from the dead. He ascended. And the Bible says, when he ascended, he came and he gave gifts unto men, to the body of Christ. And he gave unto some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And the purpose of the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers is not so that they can be above everybody because those positions are positions of servitude. We are servants. I am your servant. I am like the waitress when you go to the west, a restaurant or the waiter in the restaurant. My job is to serve you. My position is below your position. But it's a resp I'm responsible to, for my position to the head of the church, the Lord Jesus Christ. But you must submit yourselves unto the gifting and calling upon me as a pastor and a teacher so that you can let this mind be in you, which is in Christ Jesus. Because he says, he gave unto some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the perfecting, maturing of the saints so the saints can do the work of the ministry for the edifying, the building up of the body of Christ. Sheep 
begetting sheep. Amen? Okay, so <clears throat> this deliberate, deliberately give permission or deliberately submit to. Listen to this. The unrenewed mind of any Christian is what controls their criterion or standards on which their judgments or decisions are based for their actions and emotional outbursts or expressions of feelings in life. Let me read that again. The unrenewed mind of any Christian is what controls their criterion, their standards on which their, their judgments or decisions are based for their actions and emotional outbursts or expressions of feelings in life. In other words, when your mind has not been renewed with the Word of God, your lifestyle, your actions, your emotional outbursts because of sudden situations, crises, catastrophic situations that arises, is because the way you respond to it is because of your mindset. You haven't renewed your mind. And a lot of times we continue to do the same thing we did because we learned it from our parents or we learned it from some other authority figure. And it produces the same results over and over and again. Some more detrimental than others. So we have to go through this process to get our mind renewed so that we can enjoy the abundant life that Jesus came to bring, bring to us. He already bought. I come that you might have life and have it how much? More abundantly. Not in the sweet by and by, but here on the earth. Can you say amen? <clears throat> um, in the book of Romans, the sixth chapter, turn to Romans, the sixth chapter, so we can look at a biblical example in Romans, the sixth chapter. We want to read verses 11 to 13. To give an example, a biblical example. Romans chapter 6. God gives these instructions to us so that we can get our minds renewed. So that we will not continue to walk in the same mindset, the same criterion, standards or judgments or decisions that we had before we, before we became born again. Here in Romans, the sixth chapter, and we want to look at verses 11 to 13. 11, verse 11 to verse number 13. Now look what it says in verse number 11. In Romans, the sixth chapter, and verse number 13. See, the Bible is not a religious book. I said that once, I said it again, so I'll let you know. The Bible was written so that the believer, the Christian, can renew their mind. So that they can enjoy the abundant life that Jesus came for us to live. That we might have life and have it more abundantly. Not in the sweet by and by, but here on the earth. God doesn't want us to be bound by the things that happens to the ungodly in this world. Fear. Agitating passions. Anxieties. Worry. Frustrations, confusion. That's not the will of God for the believer. So he says in Romans the 8th chapter, he says this, and looking at verses 11 to 13, he says, likewise, he's talking to me and you, likewise, reckon, which means recognize you also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin or the sinful nature that you once had, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Then he says in verse 12, let's read it together. Ready, go. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Verse 13. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Look what he says. He says, let not, let not sin reign. Let not. But he says, neither yield. 
your members, which is talking about your physical body, your members is talking about your physical body, for your body, for you are a spirit, you have a soul, and you live in a physical body. Your body is not all, the, the, your body that I see now and my body that you see is not the, all that entails who I am. I am a spirit living inside of this physical body. And in you, you your spirit, the real you, lives inside of your body. We can't see your spirit. I can't see your spirit. You can't see my spirit. But man is a spirit. And the part of you that became a new creature in Christ Jesus, the part of you that became born again is your spirit, the real you. You've been made in the image of God. God is a spirit. It is your body that you have to do something with after you become born again. And this is the part of let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, has to come into the knowledge of. Because Jesus knew that he was a spirit, that he had a soul, and that he lived in a physical body. And when he operated on the earth, he operated out of his spirit and not out of his flesh. We know that when John the Baptist, his cousin, the only person that knew that he was from God and that he came to bring salvation to mankind all over the world. Behold, the Lamb of God, which cometh to take away the sins of the world. And then Herod, Herod cut his head off at the bequest of his brother's wife, whom he ended up marrying, which put him and her in the position of adultery under the law, cut his head off, not only because she wanted him to do it. This was Jesus' cousin, the only person that knew who Jesus was. What if that was your cousin? How would you feel and what would you do? You'd be mad and upset. You'd be one to take revenge. If you had power, you would go and take revenge. Jesus could have done the same thing. He could have called 12 legions of angels down and wiped out Harold and all of the pet people in the palace and all of the military might that was around him. But Jesus didn't do that. When he heard that story, he went away, he prayed, and he went and ministered to people. Because he knew a truth that no man on the earth knew at that time and he walked in the light of it. He didn't let that bother him. In fact, he got to see John the Baptist again anyway and he knew he would. Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. You got to let it. He says, let not, he said, let not sin. This is a for example. Remember, the unrenewed mind of any Christian is what controls their criterion, their standards on which their, ju their, ju their judgments or decisions are based for their actions and emotional outbursts, expressions or feelings in this life. It's because your mind is not renewed. Because Jesus' mind was renewed, he could respond to the crisis of life the way he did. Not because he was God manifested in the flesh, you either erase that thought from your mind. He operated as a man like you and I. So God says he wants all of us to be conformed to his image, to be like Christ. Okay, go to Galatians, the fifth chapter. Go to, we're looking at some for examples. For examples. Let this, I said, let not sin therefore reign in your bodies. Reckon ye also to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God. Let not sin reign, uh, yield not your members unto unrighteousness, but yield yourself unto God. That's the instructions that God gives us in the word for you, the born again believer. You have a responsibility. You have to deliberately do something. Galatians chapter 5 and verse number 1. These are God's instructions to us that we need to let get 
let this mindset get inside of us. This thinking, these thoughts, this knowledge, this is what you need to acquire. Don't just read it here in the service on Sunday and then go back home and forget about it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday because, well, that was just only for Sunday because Sunday is when I go to church and that's when I do church things. But on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, I go back to the same mindset, the same criterion that I had before I became born again. No, 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 no. That's not what your life is all about. You've been, you've been delivered out of the powers of darkness. You're in the kingdom of God in the kingdom of God and you have to go through the metamorphosis you have to get your mind renewed these scriptures are given to you so you can live by and you can live by them only the Christians can live according to the word now whether they will or choose to do it or not is up to them because look what he says in Galatians in Galatians the fifth chapter verse number one if you're there say man it says in Galatians 5 1 and there's a Bible in the seat. If, a, if somebody uh, doesn't find a Bible in the seat, pass them to them from the front row or the back row, wherever you're at. Amen. If they need a Bible. Okay. Galatians 5.1. Now let's read Galatians uh, first chapter out loud together. Ready, go. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. He says, stand fast in the liberty. Because we have been, we have been called, we have been, we have been born into liberty. We have been made free from sin. Reckon ye yourselves indeed dead unto sin. Reckon yourselves dead unto sin. Remember you read that back over in the book of Romans, the sixth chapter? You don't have to turn there. I'll turn there for you. Okay? He says, likewise, in like manner. Because first he said in verse 10, he says in verse, you know, verse 10, it says, Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead and then, uh, indeed unto sin, but alive unto God. Recognize this. Then he says, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Now he goes and tells us, now he goes and tells us, now he goes and tells us, he says in the scriptures, Stand fast therefore in the liberty, in the freedom, well, what Christ has it's hat, excuse me. I, I need some help here. I have a little bit of edge invocation. Is has past tense, present tense, or future tense? Has is what? It's future tense? It's, it's past tense. Has. It says, stand, fa stand fast, therefore, in the liberty where with Christ has made us free. So is has past tense, present tense, or future tense? Huh? Is all of it? Lauren says past. She a student. All of us, y'all, I don't know what y'all is. So I know she right. I don't know why Ari said over there quiet. I know she knew what the word was. No, it's past tense. He says, stand fast in the liberty where with Christ has made you free. And look at the latter part of that verse of Scripture. And do not be entangled with the yoke of bondage. Do not be entangled. That's something that you have to do. See, you think that God is going to deliver you. Or you think that by coming to church and having the preacher pray and lay his hands upon you and pray on you is going to deliver you. And there is deliverance through the preacher. There is a manifestation of the Spirit of God. There is the name of Jesus that we can use for people that don't know any better, that open the door to demonic oppression or demonic possession. There are, there's power available to deliver those type of people. But normally, Christians... Don't need that to be done for them. They're the ones to not let themselves to be entangled with the yoke of bondage because they begin to let this mindset be in them that was also in Christ Jesus. They are going through the process of getting their minds renewed with the word of God through constant church attendance, through constant reading their Bibles and doing their Bible studies and in prayer. Not because it's a religious thing to do, but because it's the lifestyle of the believer. It's called living by faith. Habakkuk 3.3 3 says the just shall live by faith. 
Romans, the first chapter, verse 16 and 17 says, Where in the, Therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, the just shall live by faith. Uh, Hebrews, the 10th chapter, verse 37 says, Now the just shall live by faith. That's the lifestyle of the believer. Galatians, the 4th chapter, it says, Now the just shall live by faith. Four times, living by faith, living is a 24-hour ordeal. You don't live for just eight hours a day. You don't live for 12 hours a day and then go to bed and then you die and then you wake up the next morning. Because if you die when you go to bed at night, you ain't waking up the next morning. You're still living while you're sleeping. Did you know that you're supposed to be living by faith while you're in the bed sleep? Because the just shall live by faith. This lifestyle of the believer, living by the word, being doers of the word, is a 24-hour deal. I, was, I, I came to me the other day. I was at home. And I, I, I began to, I don't know, the Lord just giving me this revelation. For me, myself, too. That in our homes, we should always create the presence of God by the things we watch and the things we listen to. We should create the presence of God in our home. That it always reminds us of our relationship and where we're seated up in heavenly places and who we're one with. Sometimes the things that we listen to on radio and Alexa and the Facebook on the phones and things that we look at on the internet and what have you, it really doesn't create that mindset of oneness with God and the presence of God. Even when you have people accompany you over in the conversations you have, it's finally important what you hear, what you talk about. The church has really gotten away from that. We, we have gotten away from that. Creating that atmosphere in your home. I remember my grandmother's home in Los Angeles, California. She was a holiness person. They didn't have all the, the lot of revelation that I know now, but she was a holiness woman. And I never forget the times that I would have to leave my home, my, mother, my brother and myself, and we had to walk at least three miles on the weekends, every weekend, and go to Grandma's house. And when we left our home, our home was full of strife and cursing and fighting and stuff that went on. And when we were sent to my grandmother's house, I always remember being in that home and the atmosphere of peace. And the sense of the presence of God in my grandmother's home. And I realized that she created that. You didn't come in grandma's home cursing and lying and all the other stuff that went on. You, you didn't do that. And you may snuck out the backyard and did something, but you know, not in the house. Because back then, they, they, they believed in going to get the switches off the trees out there or grabbing an iron car. You understand what I mean? But I remember the presence of God. Oh, it was so wonderful. I loved being there. And I wasn't born again. I wasn't even born again. Let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Let not sin reign. You have to do something. And if you don't do something, it won't get done. God will not make you. He wants to. He desires to. He, and you can. He, he, when you became born again, you, you received the life of God inside of you. You're one with God. The Spirit of God dwells in you. It's you submitting, deliberately submitting and yielding yourself unto him, which is yielding yourself unto his word, being doers of the word. Remember, Jesus says, Why call me Lord, Lord, and doeth not the things which I say? Because he that cometh to me and heareth my sayings, and does them, I, I, I like him as a man that built his house upon the rock. And when the storms of life came and the rains beat vehemently upon that house, it says a house steward. Because the storm, storms of life was going to come to every one of us simply because we're in this world that is inhabited by darkness, Satan and his kingdom. 
But he said, he that heareth my word and doeth not, I will liken him as unto a foolish man or woman who does not do my word and he builds his house upon the sand. There's no foundation. And when the storm, same storm and same rain beat up on the house, it says, great was the destruction of the house. Not because God was a respected person. It's because that person chose not to do God's word. He heard it. He could quote it. But he wasn't doing it. Let this mind be in you. We're talking about being conformed to the image of Christ. It's not just, it's just not a verse of scripture, you know, a, 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 a memorization scripture. You remember to do the memorization scriptures in, in the churches back then? Which I believe was a good thing, to memorize the scriptures. Verse number 16 in Galatians, the fifth chapter, if you look at verses 16, it tells you some things about when it says, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Romans the 6th chapter. Look at verse number 16. He says in verse number 16, he says, he said, this I say then. Who's he talking to? The Christian. This I say then. Walk in the spirit. Now that word spirit is really talking about your spirit, not the Holy Spirit. Even though the translator, they translated that word, the first letter in that word spirit with a capital S. Unfortunately, it was translated incorrectly. This I say, then walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. There's a constant war between your flesh and the real you, a spirit man. He says, and these are, and say, and these are contrary the one to the other. And they're on the opposing sides. So that you cannot do the things that you would. The, the struggle here. Especially when the flesh has the dominance. Because you did not let this mind be in you. Which was in Christ Jesus. You didn't deliberately go through the process of allowing your mind to become renewed. Which is a continual process anyway. Because I haven't arrived. I'm still renewing my mind. So he says in verse 18, but if you be led of the Spirit, if you walk after the Spirit, you are not under the law. That's the law of do not steal, do not commit adultery, do not lie, do not uh, murder, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Because the law still is in effect in this sense that the law was given to reveal the depth of man's fallen state in the Garden of Eden. The new law that we have under the New Testament is the law of love. And under the law of love hangs all the other laws upon the Old Testament law. Not only that, but that law is written in our hearts when we become born again because we got the love of God in us. Just a little thing I'm going to put in there, okay? A little plug. So, verse, verse number, what verse am I in? What verse am I in? Who got 18? Who got 19? Who got 18? Who got 19? 19, 19, 18, 18, 18, 18, Who got 19? 19, 19 verse. Okay. Now, say now, the works of the flesh are manifest. The works of the flesh are manifest. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies, your flesh. Now, the works of the flesh are manifest. What are the works of the flesh? Which are these? Adultery. What? Christians committed adultery? Yes. Fornication. Ooh, Christians committed fornication? Yes. Uncleanness. Lasciviousness. Uncontrolled sensual appetites. Idolatry. Ooh, that can be anything. Not just idols, statues. You can have an idolatry. You can commit idolatry by just having a... Being a fanatical sports fan. Man, you man, you got to be at home on Sunday to watch your favorite team play. And ain't nothing going to stop you. Ain't God and going to church at all. I got to be. Well, you, you've committed adultery. You're placing that higher than God. Nothing wrong with that. 
This book, when you put it higher than God, it's idolatry. Idolatry, witchcraft, hatred. Ooh, hatred? Christians hating? Yeah, it's a manifestation of the flesh. Variance. Emulations. Wrath. Strife. Seditions. Heresies. Seditions means rebelliousness. Or divisions. Heresies. Envyings. Jealousy. Are you jealous of your brother and sister in the church? Jealous because they got the position you don't? Jealous because they drive this kind of car and you don't? Jealous because they dress a certain way and look nice all the time and you comparing yourself with them, which you shouldn't be doing anyway? Murders! Ooh, you mean Christians committing that? It wouldn't be in the Bible if it wasn't possible because it's a manifestation of the flesh. Drunkenness. No. No. Christians getting drunk? Yeah. Call them sipping saints. You know, that's I just, you know, when I get off work, I'll be so stressed out and I just have to, you know, I just give me just a little glass because I want to, I just want to relax. Is that right? Yeah, Pastor. Well, can you tell me something? Oh, yes, Pastor. What do you need to know? When you drink that wine, how does it relax you? Because, you know, because the taste of it just rolls down your throat and you don't want to taste good on your taste bud. And once it, you taste the good taste and stuff, that relaxes you? Well, yeah, I like the taste. Well, is that all it does? Well, no, no, Pastor. Well, what else does it do? Well, Pastor, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know you ain't been saved all your life, Pastor. Well, no, I just, because you tell me when you drink wine, you do that so you can relax, and I want to know how does it relax you. Well, I get a little buzz. You what? I get a little buzz, Pastor. I get a little buzz. You know what I'm about? It 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 cha it changes it changes it does something to the it does something to the mind doesn't it the chemical the chemical balance to yeah it does something to the chemical balance you can't tell me that don't because I used to drink like a sailor I know what it was like Boone's form Berry wine Mad Dog twenty twenty Ripple hey cold cold bear thir Thunderbird cold bear Used to bring a cold bear and mad dog, mix them together, boy, and I'd be walking down the roadway in the military. It's like, <laughs> Thank God I'm delivered. Are oh, you supposed to put Kool-Aid in yours? Well, well see, Pastor Pat, Pat Pastor Pat used to drink the Boonesberry. You know, had the flavor in it already. She was one of them dainty. Red Bull? Red Bull? What do you know about Red Bull? What do you know? Oh, Gary. Oh, Gary. She throwing on Gary. Hey, she throwing on Gary now. Uh. See, y'all don't got all in the flesh. See how he said that? We supposed to be letting this mind be on. Y'all don't got in the flesh. Talking about it all the time. But no, when it says drunkenness, Christians getting drunk. And they try to make an excuse for it. Well, didn't Jesus drink wine back there? And Paul told Timothy, drink a little wine for thy stomach's sake. But it wasn't that kind of wine that made you all drunk and what have you. So we're talking about something that's real in life, and you wonder why the light that is inside of the Christian does not shine in the world. And they really, basically, many of them, don't give a hoot about you being a Christian because of what they have sown, saw over the years. But we can change that. You can change that. We, we should, we, God is having us minister these truths to the church, to the body of Christ. When I say me, many ministers like myself who are stickler to teaching nothing but the truth so help us God. And the truth is the word of God out of the Bible so that the Christians can come to a place of maturity and let this mind be in them that was in Christ Jesus so their light can shine before the world by their manner of life, how you live your life, how you talk, how you live, how you act, how you think.
It's more than just say, you know, Jesus love you. If you go, you just come to the Lord Jesus, you get saved. You come to my church. Oh yeah, we just, we just, you know, you come just as you are. Just come as you are. Yeah, I'll come as you are, so you can leave, leave different than what you were. You don't come there and stuff. You know what I mean? With, you know, your your pants hanging on the back of your 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 butt, and you come to church and come in the altar, and then you leave and you go back the same way. Yeah, I went to church and I got saved, man. Yeah, what's up? Is it blood? No, there's a change. You pull the pans up. Amen? <clears throat> Transform. Transforming. So he goes on and says in verse, we're in verse 21, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, that's a party spirit, always want to party, and such like, of the which I tell, which is other things, they just don't name it. There's such other things out there that Christians do they shouldn't be doing. It's the flesh. It's a ma you can always tell when the person in the flesh, but when you read this, you can tell they're in the flesh. They're fleshly Christians. They're born again. Their names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. They're going to heaven. Only thing about it is some of them are going to get to heaven sooner than they're supposed to get. Because you can't hasten your life by your lifestyle on the earth. It's not God that's doing it. It's because the God of this world seeks and seeks, seeks whom he may devour. He's seeking whom he may devour. And his own whole motive to steal, kill, and destroy. God wants you to enjoy abundant life. Then he says in verse uh, verse 21, envy is murder, as I tell you, and, that which, uh, and such like of which I tell you for, as I've also told you in time past, and they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. That's not talking about becoming born again. It's talking about inheriting the blessings of the kingdom of God. Walking in the flesh will hinder you from enjoying the blessings of the kingdom that have already been provided for you through the Lord Jesus Christ. He has blessed us with all spiritual blessings and heavenly places in Christ Jesus. It's already been done. It's a done deal. It's been paid for. You don't have to pay for it. Just go and just pick it up. Walk in the light of it. Then he says, but the fruit of the Spirit... The fruit of walking after the born-again spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such like, there is no law under any man's book on the earth as well as the law in heaven. Isn't that good? Listen to this. When a believer does not make a deliberate effort to do what it takes to renew their minds with the information contained in the Word of God, then they're choosing to allow the past acquired thoughts, habits, and beliefs to remain, which controls the outcome of their present life. Because there's no neutral place. I mean, you can't go, f you can't go from the hearing of the word and say, well, <clears throat> I just don't want to do that now. You know, but I'm going to make a choice sometime. I'm, I'm, I'm going I'm to get it right. Well, you just made a choice not to do the word of God. No, I didn't. Yes, you did. Because there's no neutral place. And you need to know that. We need to know that. Let me read this again. When a believer does not make a deliberate effort to do what it takes to renew their minds. See, I pass out sheets about confession. And I'm not going to ask nobody to raise their hands, but there's a confession sheet I passed out to the members of a body faith Christian center. And I told you to take those confessions home and I tell you to confess them every day. Because the Bible says, whosoever shall say and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he says shall come to pass, you'll have whatsoever you say it. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. 
the communication of your faith becomes effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing that is in you that is in Christ Jesus. The communication, what you say with your mouth, your confession of who you are in Christ, what you have in Christ, where you're seated at. You confess that out of your mouth every day. You don't talk about your weaknesses. You don't talk about your failures. Your inadequacies. You need to change the way you talk because your mouth is your, your mouth is your own worst enemy. The Bible says the mouth is an unruly fire that setteth on fire the course of the world in the book of James. Your mouth! That woke you up, didn't it? Sometimes you got to wake folks up. You, they're slow. Well, scare, scare them. Scare them woke, yeah. Scare, scare that, sl that slumber out of them right away. But you heard that, didn't you? Your mouth. So important. All I'm doing is teaching God's word. I'm the messenger boy. I'm, on the, I'm, I'm, I'm ministering under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. You when I prayed the prayer that he would give me utterance, that I would open my mouth and speak boldly. Some people think that's just a pretty prayer to pray before you start service. You know, it's a religious prayer. It wasn't a religious prayer. I prayed that and I believe God is, has done that and is doing it right now. He's giving me utterance. I can speak boldly. To teach the truth out of the word of God. These are truths. Jesus says if you continue my word. Then, you're my you're, then are you my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. It will make you free. If you let this mind be in you. That was in Christ Jesus. Amen. Now I want to read one more verse of scripture and we're going to close because I saw my finger went up. Turn to Joshua 1.8 real quick with me right now and this is where we're going to close at. I think this is the very apropos verse of scripture to turn to before we close this. We're going to close at that. This scripture here. Somebody said, well, hallelujah, pastor. I'm so happy. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just, I'm just joking now. I'm talking about y'all here, I'm talking about on Facebook somewhere out there. No, they just turn you off on Facebook and you won't even know it, huh? <laughs> Click the out. Joshua, the book of Joshua, chapter 1, Old Testament. Book of Joshua, right after the book of Deuteronomy. Joshua, chapter 1, look at verse number 8. I'm going to wait till everybody get there because this is the closing scripture and this will substantiate, substantiate the teaching, everything that I taught, the scriptures that we looked at. And Joshua, in the Old Testament, go to the table of contents in your Bible and look for J-O-S-H-U-A, Joshua. And in the table of contents, it'll tell you the page number for the first chapter. And then you turn there and you be there. I want everybody to be there. I want you to see with your own little bitty eyes so you know that I'm teaching you out of the Bible and I'm not giving you my opinion, what I think and what I feel. Then we're going to close. Joshua. The book of Joshua. The book of Joshua. Joshua chapter 1. You must see this with your own eyes. I know some of you are already looking at it now, but just hold on. I want all the sheep to get to the green pasture. That's what a good shepherd does. Everybody there, if you're there, say amen. All right, Joshua 1.8. Now, this is what God spoke to Joshua, but these scriptures were written for our admonition, and they were written for our instructions. All the scriptures from Genesis to the book of Revolutions. Amen. I'm excuse me, Revelations. Verse 8. This book, let's read it together. Ready to go. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein 
day and night that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Oh, there it is. It, I mean, there it is in a nutshell. Only God can say, he can only say all that I said, all them 45, 40 minutes I just talked, and just in one simple sentence, one simple verse. Isn't that awesome? That's the God we serve. He said, this book of the law, this Bible, the Bible you hold in your hand, this book of the law, it shall not depart out of your mouth. You got to speak and confess those scriptures. Shall not depart of the mouth, but thou shalt meditate, think about them there in day and night. Surround yourself with hearing the word in your home. Play those scriptures. Play those tapes, those CDs. Go back on, on the internet and play these messages that you heard on Sunday morning from your pastor. Have it going around in the house while you're walking around in the house. Sometime before you go to bed, put it on before you go to bed and let it play while you fall asleep. Put on Christian music when you wake up in the morning and let it flow through your house. He says, this book of the law should not depart of the mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein both day and night, that thou mayest observe, that thou mayest observe, that thou mayest observe to do, that thou mayest observe to do, thou, that thou, that you may observe to do. You can't do what you don't observe. Because he said, according to all that is written therein, for then, this only happens when you do the first part of it. For then you shall make thy way prosperous. And then shall you have good success. I hear stories of people that they go to church, they're Christians, but their lifestyles after they leave out of the church is just something else. Young people saying it, and some people's young people saying that, and they can what what well, what's all about this Christian stuff? I, 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 yeah, I, I, know, I know Grandpa goes to church, and, and, and I know, know he go to church. He involved with the church. But then, but then when I get with him, he, actually, he do this and he do that. I don't understand that. Well, because, again, you have not, you have, the book of the law has departed out of your mouth. You're not meditating both day and night. You're not, you can't observe to do according to what's written therein. You're not letting this mind be in you. Or either that, you haven't really made a commitment to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I'm not judging nobody. I'm just saying, you know. Jesus said you'll know, the, you'll know a tree by the fruit that it bears. You know, in some instances. But then also talk about the flesh. The manifestation of the flesh. Lasciviousness. Idolatry. Witchcraft. Barons. Emulations. Wrath. Strife. Fornication. All these things are manifestations of your flesh. And... The Bible tells us we have to do something about You want success? I know God loves you. And he cares for you. And he understands. I know he does. But he also requires for you to let this mind be in you. Well, we want to thank all of you on Facebook Live for joining us on this Sunday morning. But we want to bring this service to a close. My time is out, been out. But we want to offer you the opportunity that we've been offered, and that is to receive the gift of eternal life, which comes through the God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, John 3:16. you probably heard it before, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son Jesus into the world to condemn the world. No, he came to seek and to save that which is lost. I tell people this, and I, I know it from the scriptures, that God does not send a sinner to hell because of his sins. He goes to hell because he has not received the free gift of eternal life. Because a sinner sins because of, he's a sinner. It's his nature to sin. Like a cat acts like a cat because he's a cat. A dog acts like a dog because he's a dog. A cow acts like a cow because it's a cow. You can't make a cow act like a cat. You can't make a cat act like a dog because it's not in their nature. They must act 
what their nature is. And a sinner acts like a sinner because of his nature. Jesus said in John 3, 3, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He said in John 3, 5, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Hence I have the quotation, I say, you must be born again. Why? Well, because of what Adam did in the Garden of Eden. He died and he was separated from the life of God. We all were born of Adam and Eve because they are our great, 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 great grandfather and grandfather and grandmother. And through their seed, through their nature, it was passed down to this very time now. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, the Bible says. All are born in sin and come short of the glory of God. Therefore, we must all be born again. The way we become born again is by accepting his son, Jesus Christ. His sacrifice, which he did for us when he came to the earth, was crucified on the cross. He died and went down into the middle of the earth for three days and three nights in a place of torment, a place called Sheol. He was there to pay the penalty of Adam and Eve's transgression, their sin. And when he paid the penalty on the third day, God raised him up from the dead. He was your substitute, my substitute. He did it in place of us so that we will not have to die and go the same place. So the Bible says in book John, first chapter, verse 12, he says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power or the right to become sons of God, even to those that believe on his name. In Romans 10, 9 and 10, it says that this way is for you to receive the gift of eternal life, which comes with Jesus Christ. He said that if thou should confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, he said you will be saved. For with your heart you believe unto righteousness, and with your mouth, prayer, confession is made unto salvation. You go from here to over here by what you believe in your heart and what you confess to your mouth to God. Jesus is the Son of God. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man can come to the Father except by Him. If you would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and His redemptive work, confess that to God but because you believe in your heart, you'll be saved. So I want to ask everyone who's born again to bow their heads with us, but I want to ask you, the person that needs to receive the gift of eternal life, to bow your head and close your eyes. Not because bowing your head and closing your eyes is of any spiritual significance. It only enables you to see God and God alone because that's where your salvation, your help is going to come from. God will cause you to become born again because you received his son. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, repeat these words after me, not just to ape and imitate me because the Bible says you must believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. Repeat these words after me so that you can receive the gift of eternal life. Saints, pray along with them to encourage them because the devil does not want them to receive the gift of eternal life. So say these words with me. Say, Dear God, I come to you now just as I am, a sinner. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he came to the earth and was crucified on the cross for sin that he died and was buried and went into the belly of the earth for three days and three nights to pay the penalty of sin. I believe that on the third day that you raised Jesus Christ from the dead so I could be saved. I accept what Jesus Christ did for me. I accept him now as my Lord and my Savior. And because I believe this in my heart and I've confessed with my mouth, I am now saved. I am born again. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for saving me. Amen. Oh, praise God. The reason why we're clapping enthusiastically right now is because the Bible says the angels in heaven are rejoicing over one sinner who has repented, has come to God. And so we're just crashing the party up in heaven with you right now. Listen, we have a free gift. It's called the new birth. We want to get this gift into your hand free of charge. All you have to do is call the telephone number at the end of this broadcast. That telephone number is going to be 810 515 1286 call that telephone number call it now 
and ask for that free gift of, of, of the new birth. Let us know your name, your address, and we'll send that book to, book to you, as well as information concerning the church where we're located at, our service times. And if you just got born again, you need a church family. You need a church home and abiding faith. Christian Center is a good place for you to start at so you can grow in the knowledge of the truth. I also have another book in my hand called Walking as a New Creation After Receiving Eternal Life. It's a book that I wrote some time ago at the bequest of the Holy Spirit and my wife. And so this book also gives you a deeper teaching about what you just did about becoming born again. Also have information in the uh, autobiography, a little small autobiography about myself. But get this book. It's going to cost you $10, but it's well worth the investment. If you're born again already, I advise you to get this book also. Amen. Well, praise God, this lovely, beautiful woman that's coming up to stand by my side is none other than my lovely wife, Pastor Patricia Hamer. You probably heard at the Sunday Bible class at 10 o'clock. She always teaches the Sunday Bible class, and she is anointed, I'm telling you. Well, anyway, we want to remind you that the book of John, the 15th chapter, verse number 7 says, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. God bless you, and we'll see you real soon. Real soon, <laughs> praise God.